Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs> All right, Patricia E. Gillespie, we are talking about a very heavy topic, but one that set a precedent in U.S. cases, fire that took her. Um, you know, fill us in on, on this poor woman's tragic end named Judy Malinowski uh, that suffered massive abuse at the hands of her crazy ex-boyfriend. Yeah, so um, Judy was sort of a regular classic Midwestern girl who um, had some unfortunate interactions with the medical system when she got ovarian cancer um, that led her to be addicted to opiates. And um, after she had gotten clean, she unfortunately met a man who um, understood how to use her former addiction to control her, right? So she entered into an abusive relationship that very much centered around drugs, repeatedly reached out for help, but um, I think because of her history and her abuser's ability to charm, um, she, you know, had trouble getting out of the relationship and, and getting the help she needed. And he ultimately uh, lit her on fire after months of her saying that he was going to kill her. And she survived. And from her hospital bed um, for 700 days, she fought to um, pass a new law that would increase the sentences for attackers that intentionally disfigure their victims. And set American legal precedent by becoming the first woman to testify to her own murder. So what attracted me to that story, right, is there's somebody who, um, you know, would usually be painted as a victim and a very passive person um, because of the condition she was in, but she she really reached down inside herself and transformed herself into a hero to, to help other women from this really low position. And I was just really moved by that and knew I had to make a movie. Yeah, this is it's a heavy topic, but it's something that needed to be discussed because the two things we seem to ignore in at least the United States, I'm, I can't speak for Canada or Mexico and the rest of the North America, is domestic violence and then psychological abuse and then even uh, psychological issues like depression or anxiety. Um, why is this something that, what, at least here in the United States, we tend to ignore these topics until it's too late. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, um, unfortunately, if we were to be honest, domestic violence is sort of this perpetual second string issue, right? We know it exists, we know it's bad, but it never really um, has a moment where it comes to the fore until, as you suggested, something really catastrophic and horrible happens that um, causes a moment of outrage and not a lot of change, right? Um, I think that because it's such a pervasive issue, it's become sort of normalized. And I also think that we live in a system um, that doesn't properly prosecute it, right? Um, we're in an age of wonderful prison reform that we badly need, right? No one should be sitting in jail for a marijuana charge, right? I'm, I'm totally with you. But there's also a lot of guys who beat the heck out of their wives and their girlfriends and or, you know, do some some pretty sadistic things that um, get extremely light sentences or get turned out with probation and can repeat offend and their sentences don't increase and they just sort of ramp up to um, things like what happened to Judy, right? Because Michael, um, Judy's attacker, Michael, he had a very long rap sheet of um, domestic violence offenses and, and he just really hadn't been substantially taken off the street and, until what happened to Judy. And didn't he only get 11 years sentence for this? Yeah, so initially before Judy passed away um, in the state of Ohio, the maximum penalty he could receive for lighting his girlfriend on fire was 11 years, which is very similar to the penalty you get for lighting a car on fire. So um, obviously not not appropriate for the crime. Um, but, you know, the judge herself who sentenced that case for the aggravated arson said she was incredibly frustrated because she wanted to sentence him to more, but the law did not allow her to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we did we discussed quite a bit, you know, male to female violence in domestic relation in domestic relationships. Uh, very rarely is it referred to in the inverse, and less so reported in homosexual relationships. You know, is it because we, you know, this is slightly deviation, but is it because say for homosexual relationships, since they're both the same gender, it's not looked upon as domestic violence, it's just two people getting into a physical altercation? 
You know, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, intimate partner violence or domestic violence happens to men. It happens to the LGBTQ community. Um, I think there's probably a, a bunch of different answers to that question. I would wager a guess that in the LGBTQ community, um, you know, you're dealing with a, a double marginalized group, right? So um, they don't get the attention, the care, um, the legal intervention that they deserve. And um, we don't have systems where I think a lot of those people feel safe calling for help, right? Which is another thing that that we have to look at. Um, I And I think that's, you know, true to a certain extent in Judy's case as well, in the sense that because she had a history as an addict and was in active addiction when she was injured, she might not have felt safe or able to ask for the help that she needed because the system doesn't support people outside of a, a very small group of perfect victims, of which of course there isn't one. The, the sad thing with all this is that we also know not just from the documentary, but in human experience, because we all know somebody that's been violated one way or the other, that the police aren't allowed to intervene until the crime has taken place. There's no preventative measure. Uh, what can, what do you think as individuals we can do for preventative measures? You know, take a martial arts class, you know, weapons training, uh, you know, escapism, you know, because we have that flight or fight mentality. And then sometimes we end up freezing, which is the fourth F that, that people neglect to mention. You know, how do we help somebody like Judy that was in the third F of freezing? Yeah, I think I think there's a there are a number of ways to answer that question. I think the best, I don't think we can go out and, and take martial law into our own hands very effectively. I do think that um, one of the most important things um, advocates can do is listen to um, and support people who are in the midst of a, an intimate partner violence situation um, and help direct them to resources. If they're not comfortable calling the police, help them find a social worker. If they are afraid to leave their house, let them stay on your couch, right? Um, these kind of little things um, can make all the difference. Um, but we also need to look at this on a, a legislative level and a policy level. For example, um, you know, Judy had called the police many times throughout her relationship with Michael. She called from different addresses, zip codes, and phone numbers. So this went to, you know, three different police departments. She had 30-something calls, but the police departments, there's no mechanism by which um, the police department gets a report of surrounding area calls, right? So each police department is only looking at five, six calls, 10 calls, and they're not getting the full picture. That to me seems like a really solvable problem. Um, just like they have systems like CODIS, shouldn't we have a system that aggravates or aggregates, excuse me, domestic violence calls, right? Um, so I think there are, are smaller policy things we can do like that. And then we also need to, we need to look at the law. We need to look at why people can have you know, 10 or 11 domestic violence incidents on their records that are escalating, that go from, you know, misdemeanor assault to um, kidnapping and rape. Um, and, you know, we can see this person winding up to do something horrible and they're just allowed to go. I just, with very little intervention, and that includes like very little therapy, uh, very little prison time. Uh, that to me is really concerning. And I think it's something that we can solve at the state government level. Um, and we should be asking for more, right? I think that's what the average person can do is you can call your state senator and say, what are we doing about this? And look at the laws um, for domestic violence in your state. And then um, I think you'll probably find they're pretty insufficient. You know, with, with Judy's trial and being the first person to testify in her own murder case, you know, that that set something that we've never seen before. Um, and I, I'm happy she was able to do that, at least for her own peace of mind at the time. Uh, in making the documentary, how has your mental health been, you know, putting this together? And did you have support from her family or your own support group? Because people that are you know, suffering through these type of physical abuses are dealing with some severe mental anguish and staying because there's that fear level? Yeah, that's a really kind question. Um, I think that this was, look, when I read this story, I was so outraged by how this woman had been repeatedly failed and so heartened by this image of, you know, a victim, an imperfect victim, like all victims are, um, transforming herself into this hero that 
I just felt really passionate about it. And I don't think I, it wasn't hard for me um, to make this film. It wasn't hard for me to um, look at Judy um, in the way that some people have expressed it might be hard for them because what I saw there was really beautiful and really brave. And I felt very, very honored to be trusted by the family to take take her story to, to people. So for me, um, it, it wasn't challenging. Um, the family obviously went through something incredibly difficult. And you, if you are a normal human being, you are going to have trauma and emotional scars, um, from, from seeing something like that, especially happening to your loved one. And, you know, I think they do a really great job at reaching out for help and getting help when they need it. Um, and, you know, I hope that people who are in the middle of these situations or the survivors of these situations feel really comfortable, um, asking for professional help. Because I think when you, when you start to deal with things like PTSD or um, medical trauma there, it's really not a, a good thing to deal with on your own. You, you do need that help. You mentioned the phrase perfect victim in, in quotations. We'll, we'll put that there. What is considered the perfect victim? The little blonde girl in the Frankenstein movie from the 1930s because she's six and innocent and just wanted to hand him a flower? Yeah. So I think, look, I think there is a narrative where the system works in such a way that if you try to report an assault of any kind, they will dig in your history for everything you did wrong, right? And the reason that works is because we think victims should be saints and um, no one's a saint, right? If you dig deep enough in anyone's closet, you're going to find something that's less than ideal, whether it's a nasty text or heroin use or a previous charge, right? Um, and I think that prevents a lot of us from reporting what happened to us because we are afraid to be dragged into the public square and humiliated um, in the way that cross-examination in these cases works, right? Um, I think a lot of women and, and men don't feel entitled to help because they might feel they did something wrong. I think a, an abusive relationship is a space where victims often feel a lot of guilt. Um, guilt for staying, guilt for saying something nasty, guilt for fighting back, right? And um, I think that that prevents us from seeking justice a lot. And I think the system reinforces it. One of the things that I hope the film highlights is Michael's history with all these numerous domestic violence offenses was not allowed in court, but Judy's entire personal history was. And I really think we might want to question that, right? If somebody has a pattern of aggressive violence um, towards their intimate partners, and that's not admissible. If somebody who was the victim of domestic violence has a history with drug use, should should that be admissible um, on those terms? I, I don't know, you know? Yeah, no, this is, this is a very heavy topic. And I'm glad that you were able to shine a light on it, especially for Judy and Judy's family, because she could have been a forgotten statistic. Yeah, for sure. I, and I think one of the one of the most difficult, uh, you know, parts of getting this movie made was finding the right partners who were willing to look right. I when I was pitching this film, I had a number of people ask me if I could um, cover Judy's face somehow or blur it. And uh, I just I refused. I thought that that was so offensive that if this woman can go through all this and fight how she fought to help other women, we surely can do her the courtesy of looking. Um, but I think, you know, as you alluded to at the beginning of this interview, a lot of us want to look away, especially when it's tough. And, and we can't because women's lives depend on it, you know, and men's lives depend on it too. You know, like for myself, I have to be hyper vigilant in my reaction to things. Cause I'm a, I'm a rather large man. I'm six foot three. Um, 290 pounds. So even if someone's being aggressive to me, if I defend myself, me being so much larger than them, it looks like a silverback gorilla attacking a chimpanzee or even a spider monkey, depending on the, the smaller stature of the person on average. So I have to be hyper aware of what I look like in the court of public opinion. You know? sure. And so for someone like Judy, who had that negative background of opioid addiction, you know, to be put in the forefront when it was nothing pertinent to the case, you know, that is disheartening, especially with someone like Michael, who has had the domestic violence patterns, you know, what do we and believe it or not in the state of Ohio, because Judy was found because Judy was attacked mm -hmm. on her way to rehab with trace amounts of cocaine in her system, her family got no victims assistance. So the state of Ohio does have and many other states in this country does have laws on the books that say, 
if you are a drug user, if you are using drugs at the time of a violent crime that has nothing to do with drugs, it does have to do with it, which is insane, right? I mean, somebody lighting you on fire has absolutely nothing to do um, with with your drug use. Maybe, maybe your drug use put you in a vulnerable position, but it doesn't merit. Um, it certainly doesn't merit that kind of response, right? And I think that's that's another thing you you were alluding to of like. I have to be careful because I'm a big guy and I have to be careful of my response, right? A lot of that comes from a broken idea um, about mutual abuse. Mm -hmm. And it can be really hard for people to suss out when they fight back that that's, that's not abuse, that's self-defense, mm -hmm. right? And obviously you need to be measured and appropriate there. Um, but, you know, I think there are a lot of people also who don't report their incidents because they feel, oh, well, you know, I hit him back. I'm just as bad as he is. Um, but that's that's something very different. And Judy, I mean, the the defense made a meal out of her throwing a pop on him, a soda on him when he was chasing her um, around the gas station parking lot. Oh, she's she did it first. She threw this soda at him. Um, you know, she, she was trying to get away from him. That's not an abusive behavior. That's a that's a reactive behavior. Trish, is there one thing that you want from the documentary for people to sit there and at least take note of? I mean, you condense this whole trial and this this poor women's uh, issues into 95 minutes, roughly. Um, and I'm glad that you were able to tell a cohesive story, especially with it being at the Newport Beach Film Festival this week, um, you know, which is one of the festivals I'm covering. Uh, what would you like the one lesson for audiences to take away from the fire that took her? I would like... Look, I think this film is made for two audiences. Um, I would like the women who are in or have been in um, situations with intimate partner violence or, or the men who've been in situations with intimate partner violence to um, look at this and feel like it's okay to tell the truth, that if they want to report what happened to them, that they can, that we as a society are beginning to understand um, the, the smear campaign that victims face and we're beginning to be able to sort of see it for what it is. Um, and that just because you've been in a position where you've been made a victim doesn't mean you can't be a hero. Um, that's very important to me. Uh, and it's also important to me that people see this film and say, okay, yeah, what now? Because I, I do think Judy's story lays out so clearly the holes in our system from the medical system to, you know, how we police domestic violence to um, the court system and failing legislation, right? So from, from the ground right on up, it, it points out all these holes in the system that a lot of victims slip through. And I think I want people to say, okay, well, we have to do something about this. And I want them to be engaged. I want them to look into the legislation in their area and, and, and ask the representatives for more to just take that five minutes to make that phone call and say, what are you doing? What are you doing about this? You know, um, because that's the only way we're going to see change. Trish, thank you so much for your time today. Please remind thank us you. about Judy's foundation, where uh, your website for the movie and where we can find you on social media if we want to connect and talk. Yeah, we don't have a website for the movie. But um, so Judy's uh, mom has started a foundation uh, to try to help push uh, legislation at a state by state level um, to improve the lives of domestic violence victims. Uh, you can find more about that at judysfoundation.org. Um, and we have, uh, Steve, should I say something about Paramount Plus or no? Um, I'm not, we can just say it's going to be airing on Paramount Plus sometime in the future. Okay. And the, yeah, so the film will be, um, we're having a small theatrical release in New York and LA this weekend. And, um, then it will be released on Paramount Plus in the future for national viewers. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations on a documentary that really reveals something that has been lacking in Western society. Yeah, thank you for sitting with it. I know it's uh, it's not an easy watch, but um, I really appreciate you taking the time. That was my pleasure. Thank you.